Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast channel for sustainable procurement. We hope you like what you hear. Please go to www.iso2400.org for more information, learning resources, tools and much more. Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast for sustainable procurement. I'm Sean McCarthy, Director of Action Sustainability Community Interest Company. This is episode two of two of our podcast with Laura Dombey from DNV, where we talk about the role of audit in a broader supply chain management context. I think it's interesting that you mentioned having a, a holistic picture of supply chain risk, and I, I guess it probably goes beyond that in terms of a more strategic view of supply chain management. And if I just a couple of examples again from my own experience was the computer manufacturer that changes all of its suppliers every six months, not all at the same time, but you know the the life of a, a component supplier for this manufacturer is six months, and then they move on, they go out to competitive tender, and they again to another supplier in the interest purely of just driving the price down and down. Well. By the time you finished an audit and done the report, you know, you, this, that supplier's gone and you've started another supplier and it, it's virtually impossible to, to build any sort of relationship against, uh, again, a, a supplier that I know well in uh, in quarried products in the construction sector. They have very long-term relationships with their stone suppliers in India where they've been working with them for 20 years and they've helped to build schools for the kids and they, they look at how people are employed and make sure that, you know, that the children actually go to school, they're, they're not, and if children are working, then they're getting an education as well, because in some parts of the world, you know, the children are the only people in the family that are able to work. So there seems to be a big difference between establishing those very long-term relationships with, with the supply chain, where a relationship can be built up and there can be engagement in addition to auditing as against some supply chain practices where it just appears to to be impossible to achieve any sort of transparency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think perhaps just kind of building on, on our previous point as well, I think, you know, assuring ESG characteristics must go hand in hand with the product provenance or the chain of custody of that product. So, so I don't agree that, you know, you just have couple of organizations in your supply chain and you know those are uh, meeting certain criteria but you also need to think about the traceability and the chain of custody in in parallel to that I think that is such a good point in terms of you know I work a lot in these sectors or you know that are you know spot spot buying the materials from the market right like one day you have metals from you know, certain countries, the, the, you know, the, a couple of years, <laughs> you know, a couple of days later, those, those will come from, from totally different countries. And so I think what is really important here is to understand the role of traders as well and understand how markets operate and what are the risks and, and the challenges that th- this, these operations will pose to, to the end clients and the end customers. So if, you know, I work a lot, you know, first thing that cast houses tell me, so cast houses where you mix different parts of metals together to, to make a final product. And, you know, first thing they tell me, well, you know, I may know <laughs> where one of one or two, you know, primary metals are, are coming from, but, you know, we are buying scrap from the market. We, you know, that, that is really, really, there's, there's a lower level of, of visibility available there. So, and that is something, for instance, the ASI recognized, uh, you know, early on and, and the new iteration of their chain of custody standard, for instance, there are particular requirements for traders and how you can construct contracts with the traders so that you have an approved list of suppliers for primary metal. You know, the laws need to be all, for instance, ASI certified and you what is the documentation that that needs to be provided by the trader? So it's, it becomes the trader's responsibility in order to fulfill their contract to demonstrate these ESG characteristics, whether they source from Kazakhstan, South Africa, Brazil, you know, whatever, whatever they source from, you know, these customer expectations are are communicated down the supply chain. And I think this is where I, what I see as the, the biggest bottleneck. And we are very much at the, the beginning of, of this journey. But you look, I think 
the, the role of the brands is to is to ask, is to continue pushing, is to continue uh, investing in due diligence and and in, in and and cascading these best practices and requirements. And you know, at least we now have it in writing, right? We it's in writing that this is a industry best practice, and you know, the the OECD uh, due diligence guidance uh, has been referenced a lot in the industry as well as another vehicle through which these common expectations uh, will be pushed down the, the value chain. So slow progress, but a very challenging question, but but there are you know solutions out there that that companies can refer to. You, you talked earlier about you know things like using satellite technology and, and that sort of thing in addition to to personal visits. Where do you see the role of technology generally? in supply chain transparency. I'm thinking think technology is like blockchain, which I, I probably have an incomplete understanding of. But you know, technology is moving on and, and how are things changing in your world? Another yeah, great question that we could spend the rest of the podcast on, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so with digital technologies, as I mentioned, right, you're looking at kind of the you know, side by side ESG characteristics. So, you know, this site is ESG and then, you know, you, you are then reporting this maybe in your sustainability report that, you know, X percent of my supply chain is meeting my supplier code of conduct or a responsible sourcing policy. Now, with the digital product passport regulations coming in, companies will need to provide that provenance and, and that visibility at a product level. So that will be really quite a game changer in terms of, you know, understanding each batch, you know, what are the, the particular characteristics of, of this, you know, product batch, where do they come from, you know, who is the supplier and, and what is the ESG performance of, of that supplier at that product level. So I think that's going to be quite, quite game changing. And technology such as blockchain is, is already being used. I feel that the key kind of blocking point is really understanding that that value proposition you know why should brands do this and and you know are the, their customers interested so you know if i think if you th- think about ev vehicles and, and automotive there is a much clearer i would say value proposition there because you know consumers we, we want to make sure that when we are buying um, an ev vehicle and then the battery and you know the the whole you know uh, EV car uh, is is meeting these um, you know ESG expectations, and we want to see some more information about it. So I think in certain industries this will happen much quicker than in others. In terms of you know other digital enablers, I mentioned uh, worker voice, or I could also mention supply chain data collection. So you know things like carbon emissions, or things like you know social and and human rights impacts. You know companies companies have two issues they either have too much data <laughs> some big data that they can't make sense of or they have too little data um, and I think that is key paradox when, when it comes to supply chain sustainability that either you have too much information or not enough information or not enough information that you can trust right so I, I think well, increasingly what we see with our clients is implementing a digital system that is able to gather this information so you know there are product hierarchies in there so you understand what is tier one what is tier two what is tier three you're able to map these relationships in a digital tool and then you can automate this engagement yeah so i mean if you are engaging with you know six seven hundred suppliers every year this is a very costly thing to do like you know (laughs) you will have a lot of your interns you know just picking up the phone and and, and, you know, wanting these suppliers to provide a, an ESG certificate. So I think automating um, in this engagement and, and getting, you know, verifiable information out of the suppliers is, is really key. So integrating the data, coll- the supply chain data collection process with, with an assurance process behind it so that, you know, there are periodic uh, checks that, you know, ex- exactly those, you know, carbon data or, or human rights data can be can be trusted is is really important and and these are the key key things that we are working on with with, with our clients at the moment again an interesting question about uh, about kind of data and reliable data again what i'm starting to see is is as demand builds rapidly for, for new stuff 
then it's a bit like the Wild West they are today because the regulation doesn't catch up with the product. And uh, pieces of work recently that I've been looking at, um, solar panels, everybody wants solar panels. Most of them come from China. It's very, you know, it's a very Chinese dominated market and that, that market is not very transparent. Hydro-treated vegetable oil. Everybody wants a diesel substitute and this is the magic bullet that's going to solve our problems. Except once again, there are issues around the the source, you know, what's the, the primary feedstock for HVO? It can be palm oil, it can be waste cooking oil, it can be lots of different things. And hydrogen, of course, everybody wants hydrogen now because hydrogen is, is the new thing. And there are various different colours of blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, purple spots hydrogen, whatever, depending on how the hydrogen is made. And there seems to be a perception at the top of the value chain that the chief executive says we need to decarbonize, so we're going to get some of this stuff. But actually, the, the value chains are more complex than that. And there isn't a nice certificate like FSC for my timber or whatever that, that tells me that's a reliable product. So how are you seeing the, this sort of emerging market for new things against the, the potential lack of, of regulation or reliable certification for it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, mentioned solar, for instance, I've been working in the solar industry for the past two, two to three years now. So when it, your first first reports came out of some polysilicon, which is a key component of, of the solar PV modules being associated with forced labor risk in, in the Xinjiang region. And there were, you know, a number of NGO reports coming out and and linking the, the solar industry, but also you know other industries like aluminium or, or or cotton as well to these to these risks. And I think that's where you know since then the kind of forced labor ban in the U.S. and and in the EU now as well have have really I would say sprung a, a whole myriad of initiatives that the industry has has now kind of responded to. But I think at the start of the conversations, you know, <laughs> many many. Investors or, or companies came to me about, you know, Laura, how can you assure that, you know, this product is not associated with human rights abuses or it's not associated with, you know, forced labor? And and this is the million dollar question, right, in terms of uh, how, how you can assure this system. And I, I don't think we have a definite answer yet. You know, these questions, you know, mentioned FSC and timber and palm oil. So some, you know, or cotton. So some uh, industries have experienced these, you know, responsible sourcing risks much earlier on. And, and they developed their own industry initiatives that, that responded. So with different levels of, you know, chain of custody, there there came, you know, different levels of, of assurance. And, and I think that is what we see with you know, for instance, solar as well now that the, the industry again came together. They wanted to make sure that the whole system is built on a kind of as a, a credible approach. So bringing together NGOs, bringing together the EU Commission, for instance, and, and industry leaders to define these these benchmarks. And I think what what is, you know, happening is is exactly kind of building that business case of why you should provide that supply chain visibility, you know, why is it important? And uh, it, I think it's not just about the regulations coming in, but it's really around the longer term viability of, of the industry. So, you know, here, solar products are, are so dependent on, you know, these rapidly developing supply chains and, you know, solar has become, you know, the price of, of solar energy has, has really dropped and, and plummeted over the last few years. And I th I, the EU commissioner's kind of key, keynote uh, speech really stuck with me at the end of, at the beginning of December, who said, well, we want solar without regrets. So it's not enough <laughs> that, you know, solar industry is seen as always part of the climate transition, as, as part of the good guys, but they have some skeletons in, in, in that you know, <laughs> in that cupboard. So they need to work very diligently uh, with their partners. Again, you know, 
disengagement is used as last resort, right? I think where we are at the moment is to to build that business case, uh, work with the with the module manufacturers to understand, you know, where these, you know, where the polycon source, silicon sources are, where the silicon sources are, and map out the supply chain in the first instance. And and I think that's is uh, that's where the industry is at the moment to build that business case. It's not a quick win again. So, you know, th there needs to be some strategies in terms of diversification. And, you know, there's more and more talk in the EU and the US to build kind of more capacities here or, or outside of China. But, you know, th th there is no question about it that there will be a, a you know, continuous re relying on, on these resources. And so, again, I'm coming back to so for building supply chain capacity and uh, engagement as, as key success factors. But that's not easy to do. Yeah, thank you. I think, as you say, it's a, a continuous challenge, and and there'll always be new stuff coming to market, um, where the the, the regulation and, and the certification follows on behind. And um, final question, if I can, because I, I could talk about this <laughs> for the rest of the day. A lot of our audience, the people that listen to our podcast, are in some way involved in supply chains or involved in the procurement profession. What would be your advice to a procurement person going? Oh, I'm hearing about all this ESG stuff. How do I tackle it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, starting with the policies and, and the strategy, right? Like, I think do an assessment of what has worked well in the past and where are the key gaps. I think one thing that is, is often missing for me is, is around checking and monitoring the effectiveness of these measures, right? Like, just really understanding, okay, you know, I've done all these audits, I've done this, you know, supply chain engagement survey, I've done these, you know, questionnaires. <laughs> and and so, you know, almost just like collecting this data is is almost like a success in itself. And so companies just are like, okay, well, we take a break now. <laughs> and we collected the data. So, you know, well done. And, and often kind of, you know, lack a, a really kind of systemic review of, well, you know, based on this, how can I reassess my risk profile where are my opportunities and you know what what is the materiality of these these impacts you know what where are my material impacts that's where i would start is to really understand uh you know at a high level in a supply chain mapping you know what are the different commodities that, or, or or you know products that i'm procuring and, and what is the kind of inherent you know geographic or category risk uh, what is the the existing information that i have and what is it telling me about my risk profile and so where should I invest you know where does it really count you know where there could be perhaps you know I have low or medium risk you know suppliers and, and there maybe I'm okay if I just you know collect some data from them through a digital tool once a year uh, but then I have my strategic suppliers or I have my kind of high risk suppliers and there I really want to make sure that they have a good grip on these ESG risks so I'm going to spend you know more of more time, more money, more resource, uh, actually understanding that that risk exposure. Yes, it's all about priorities. Couldn't agree more. Um, Laura, it's been fascinating uh, getting an insight into the world of the auditor and some of the complexities that we see um, in these uh, these multi-tiered supply chains. So thank you very much. I'm sure our audience are going to love hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you for listening to our podcast on Sense and Sustainability. Please listen out for more episodes. For more information, learning resources, tools, and much more content on sustainable procurement, go to www.iso2400.org.